Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can properly and correctly implement production grade retry policies for your C-sharp code. Having worked with microservices for a long time, I don't think I've ever worked on a service that didn't implement retry policies in some capacity, whether that is about consuming a message or an event, doing some in-memory work, or even calling some API to get some data, which is the example I'm going to be using in this video for demonstration purposes. Now, I've seen this done wrong many, many times, and it always has devastated effects, usually for the service you are calling or consuming and you're retrying on. And I'm going to explain all that in this video and remove any ambiguity from the issue. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, ring the notification bell, and for more training, check out nickchapsters.com. Now, before I show you the code, I want to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Octopus Deploy. Octopus Deploy is an automated deployment and release management tool used by leading continuous delivery teams worldwide. It helps DevOps teams at over 25,000 companies accelerate reliable, repeatable, and traceable deployments across different cloud providers and on-premises infrastructures. With more than 500 different automation step templates and integrations with hundreds of technologies like Azure, AWS, GCP, Azure DevOps, and way, way more, connecting your processes together into one pipeline has never been easier. It's actually what I've personally been using for the past five years in my last two jobs, working with microservices in both major cloud providers to manage my deployments and build simple but also complex CD pipelines Lines, and I've been extremely happy with it. It was actually the only DevOps tool over the past five years that was never changed for a different tool because nobody had a problem with it. It does what it needs to do and it does it well and reliably. So if you want to get started with Octopus Deploy, check the link in the description and thanks again so much to Octopus Deploy for sponsoring the video. All right, so what do I have here? So here I have a simple weather forecast API, which has a controller with a single endpoint. And all this endpoint has is a weather forecast retrieval uh, endpoint that accepts the city and then returns the weather. So if I go ahead and I run this endpoint, as you can see, if I call the endpoint to get the weather for London, then I'm getting the weather for London right now. And if I do, I don't know, something like Paris, then I'm getting the Paris weather. And you're probably thinking how this works. It's not an in-memory thing. I'm actually calling the open weather API and I have a client defined over here for that. I'm using an API key with a quota and everything. And this is the call that gets sent to that API with the API key. By the time you're watching this video, this key will be long gone. So don't even bother using it for your own purposes. You can just grab your own. It's basically free up to certain requests per hour, I think. Now, in a realistic scenario, this code wouldn't go anywhere near production. I wouldn't be allowed to push it because it is not resilient. What if this weather API doesn't respond or if a request times out, do we really want to return an exception or a 500 to the user or, I don't know, some other response code? No, we probably want to retry if it is a transient error. And an HTTP transient error is usually any status code over 500. So 500, which is internal server error and above, and also request timeout, you would probably want to retry. Now, how you would do that is pretty straightforward. You probably have a loop with retry counts and say for up to an amount of time, uh, retry it. I'm going to use a label and go to to visualize how we do it, but don't use labels and go to's, use uh, loops. So what would happen is you would probably have like a start point over here and then you would have a try and a catch. The try will contain over here these two things and then the catch will catch the HTTP request exception. And this is one of the things you'd probably um, retry, maybe depending on the exception as well, but generally these things can be retried. And the other thing you'd retry is probably say, if response to status code is more or equals to internal server error or is request timeout, then also retry. And this is where you probably also implement like a retry count equals zero. And then every time this thing is retried, you would increment it and then go to start, which is the same logic that you would have here. And maybe you also want to have a bit of a delay because you don't want to spam retry things. You might say, okay, maybe wait, I don't know, for a second before you retry. You would probably build something like that. Now, as you can see in this retry policy, even though functional, assuming I added the top level check that says that if retry count is more or equals to, I don't know, five, then return bad stuff. 
which we're not going to implement now, then even though that this is absolutely functional, it works and it will do the job, it is not really very elegant for our code. And what happens if you have more requests or you're using more clients? You have to implement this very nasty looking stuff everywhere in your code. Well, you kind of did, but we can actually make this way, way better for ourselves. And the recommended approach that I have here is to use a new kit package called Poly. So Poly, if we go ahead and reformat it, is a new kit package. It's this one with a parrot over here, and it has a lot of resilience policies already baked into it, and it makes it very, very easy through a fluent interface to actually implement them. So now that I added it, I can go up here and I can say private read-only I async policy, and I want my policy to be on the HTTP response message, which is what this response is actually returning. So I'm going to apply it there. And I'm going to just say retry policy. And the great thing about this is that I can just define it in one place and then reuse it everywhere else. So I don't have to have it on every single place. And what I'm going to use is I'm going to use the policy class. I'm saying that this is a policy for the HTTP response message. And at this point, I can tell it to, in my case, handle and I want to handle an exception in this case. That exception was the HTTP request exception. And I can also say or some other expression and chain things, or I can even say or result. And in this case, I will be able to access my HTTP response message and say HTTP response message status code is more or equals than the internal server error or exit status code equals the request timeout. And I can actually use the new features to merge this into a pattern. So this looks a bit cleaner. And now I can define what I want this to be. So I can have a fallback policy, a retry policy, a circuit breaker. I'm planning to actually cover all of this. But what I want to do at the very surface level is just retry async and I can specify how many times I want. So let's say retry for five times. So now I have my policy defined and I can copy that. And I can wrap this call over here and say execute async, use a delegate. And now I wrapped this call in the policy. So this call will be run through that policy. And if any of those conditions that I defined here is met, so in case of an exception or a status code within that range, the thing will retry for up to five times. But the retries will be back to back to back. There won't be any wait between them. If I want to have a wait, I could also have a wait and retry for a specific time async. Let's park this for now. Let's just leave it with retry async. And I will explain why, because just retrying in this case isn't really enough. Retrying goes deeper if you want to do it correctly. And to explain why that's the case, I'm going to bring the whiteboard. So let's go ahead and swap to the whiteboard. And what I want to have is the exact same scenario that we have here. I have some API that is calling the weather API over here. Now imagine a bunch of people over here planning to call that API at the same time. So bam, 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 bam. And I have to handle all four of these requests and send them to the weather API because I need the weather. Now what happens if the weather API goes a bit boom, let's say for, I don't know, one minute, then what this will do is every request from them will basically be tunneled through me and I will try to send those requests, but because the API will say, well, I can't really handle them, then me, the API, will try to retry five times per API requests I'm retrieving. And because users are just very prone to just spamming the refresh button, I can actually chain what is effectively an attack to this API with any back off period. Now, to prevent that, one way to deal with it would be to add a back off period. So you would have like a one second pause between retries, right? And that way, I have these periods where I don't really do anything, but then these periods where I'm sending the request. That is a good first step, but it is still problematic because it is not really a big enough time to recover. If something didn't respond with a one second delay, then it isn't that likely that within the next second it will respond. So what we tend to implement is something called exponential backoff, where in the beginning you wait for one second, then the next time you wait for two seconds, then maybe for four seconds, then for eight seconds, 16 seconds, and so on and so forth. 
you kind of need to be careful with this approach, the exponential one, because who wants to wait 16 seconds to get the response? That's really bad user experience. So you have to kind of pick your battles and say, okay, what is acceptable for me? One plus two, three plus, okay, seven, seven seconds, maybe it's on the high end, but I accept that. And that way of exponential back off is better, but it still suffers by the fact that as everyone is just calling this API, you're synchronizing the time that you're calling that API, the weather API through your own service. So this is still not great because even though it backs off, it doesn't have great retry distribution. To prevent that, what we do is we introduce randomization element and we call that the jitter. So what this means is the first time we're gonna maybe wait for 1.1, but maybe for 0.9, but maybe from 0.89 or maybe 0. Uh, another time. And then the second time we're gonna do 2.2 or maybe 2.1 or maybe 2.01 or whatever, and then 4.3 or maybe 4.0 or maybe 4.1 and it goes on and on and that way you distribute your tries better and actually gives more breathing room for the API itself and you also eliminate this dead zone of your application basically doing nothing. Now if you wanted to implement exponential back off in this scenario you would say something like wait and retry async and let's say five times and that would use this overload over here with the integer which is retry attempt over here. And we would say something like time span from seconds math dot the power raising a specific number to the power and then would use two to raise that to the power of a specific value and that would be the retry attempt and that way you have this exponential back off. Now the problem with this is it doesn't have any randomization element, it doesn't have the jitter and I could just sit here and complicate things and implement it but actually there is a pre-baked package that contains the best way effectively to implement a jitter and you don't have to worry about it. And I'm going to add it. That is the poly.contrib.wait and retry package. It contains, as you can see over here, I'm going to just comment this thing out and I can say wait and retry async. It contains this back off class and this back off class has a bunch of different predefined back offs. Constant backoff, exponential backoff, linear backoff, then AWS decorrelated jitter backoff, and then the decorrelated jitter backoff v2, which is effectively the recommended approach to do things. We're going to choose that and we're going to define a couple of things. First, we're going to say that the base of the backoff will be one second. And by base, I mean the median first retry delay. And then I'm going to specify the count, which is five. And that's it. And if we go in here to see how that thing is implemented, then it is uh, not super complicated. I mean, you can wrap your head around it. There's a lot of math and there's the randomization factor that I mentioned before. If we search for random in here, yeah, we will find the concurrent random class, which accepts a seed, by the way. So if you want deterministic backoffs in your jitter, you can even provide a seed which will ensure that your backups are deterministic. But in any case, we don't want it here, so I'm just going to remove it. And that's it. This is effectively production grade retries for your application. However, we wouldn't really do that in this specific scenario. For any other scenario, absolutely fine. But .NET actually has a poly integration package that can be used with the HTTP client factory. And if you don't know what the client factory is or what named clients are, I made a great video explaining all that. I'm going to put it in the top right corner of your screen. You can watch that after this video because you don't really need to watch it now, but watch it later. It's really, really good. And I can go here and just basically revert this to what it was. So remove the wrapping into the policy and just have it exactly as it is. And as you can see, this policy isn't used. I'm going to leave it exactly as it is. And I'm going to go ahead and add the HTTP.poly package, which is that integration point between the HTTP client factory and poly itself. And I'm going to now go into the program.cs and say add policy handler. And I can use the exact same code if I want to do so. Just copy that and just paste it here. Import things. And it works. And what this will effectively do is just add this policy on anything in this HTTP client. And of course, you can extract this policy into a variable and reuse it across all of your HTTP clients if you want to. That's how flexible it is. However, it actually goes deeper than that. I can just comment this fella out 
And because these transient errors are such a standardized thing, there's actually an extension method called add transient HTTP error policy, where I can simply configure my policy here. And I can just say this thing, which is wait and retry async goes here, and then copy my back of definition, paste that here, and then, well, that's it. Everything is made for me. And if we go in this add transient HTTP policy, you can see that the policy is this handle transient HTTP error, which is public. You can reuse it if you want to without the extension being present. And it's the same thing, HTTP request exception or transient HTTP status code. And those are anything bigger than 500 or equals to request timeout, the exact same thing that we had. So all of that code that we had before now is just these two lines of code and it automatically applies to everything in that client without having to wrap every single call explicitly, which is very, very elegant. And as long as you're using back off with a jitter and you know how far back it can go from a UX perspective, you have a properly implemented retry policy for your ASP.NET Core application. Again, it doesn't have to be an HTTP request. You can just use the raw approach to handle anything. Just specify the object, explain what you want to handle and pick how you want to retry. But proper back off, especially with third party services, can go a long way in stability of the system and for the service you're consuming as well. Now I'm planning to cover way more things about resilience, so make sure you subscribe to not miss any of the new episodes. Well, that's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making this video possible. If you want to support me as well, you can find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.